If you're checking out this video and you're interested in seeing other conversations between the Futureverse founders, Aaron McDonald, Shara Senderoff, and other goodies, I do have a lot on my page of other uploads from various sessions. As well, I have made a playlist that I will throw in the description that highlights pretty much all of the speaking sessions that are available on YouTube. And if you do find this valuable, uh, be sure to check out my membership page. It's $2.99 a month if you enjoy keeping up to date with everything Futureverse. And be sure to check out my daily X feed live live streams by going over to the live feed tab. Okay, let's get into this particular session. I'd like to kick off straight into it by introducing Aaron McDonald. Uh, Aaron is a 20-year technology industry veteran who's at the cutting edge of blockchain and Web3 technologies. He's the co-founder of Futureverse and Readyverse Studios, uh, which have created the platform and tools for a multi-world, multi-IP metaverse experience for mass consumers. Think of this as the future of entertainment and the internet. Aaron, I'll, I'll let you demystify the metaverse and Web3 for those that may not be familiar with it. Um, what I'd note here is that Futureverse is one of only a handful of New Zealand unicorns, you know, privately held businesses with a valuation of over a billion dollars. And we do believe that it's New Zealand first Maori led unicorn. Uh, Aaron was co-founder Centrality, general partner at NetX Ventures and D64 Ventures, co-founder of Non-Fungible Labs and co-founder of Altered State Machine. And in 2019, he was named Ernst & Young Technology Entrepreneur of the Year and recognized by IDG of, as one of the top 50 technology leaders. So I'll hand over to Aaron to talk about the work that he's doing. So yeah, so um, thanks everyone for having me on. Really excited to be here to share a little bit about our story. Um, as we kind of went over in that video, Futureverse is a Kiwi um, media tech business. Um, so we make software uh, for the entertainment, media, video games industry. Um, and really what we do is we kind of focus it on um, what we'd call um, the open metaverse. Um, so a little bit of kind of um, definition for what that is, um, because it is a term that's used a lot. Um, and there's lots of different ways to think about it. But our simple way to think about it is, um, it's the internet growing up. Um, and so taking um, what was a flat web experience and making it into a more converged and immersive web experience. Um, so it's blending all the things that used to be kind of standalone bits of your internet experience into one thing. So if you think in the past, you had, um, you know, these different silos of experience in media and communications and finance and banking and gaming. 
Um, and you used to kind of experience those and go different different places to experience those, and they were quite siloed. When I started in technology, they were so siloed, in fact, that media companies and communications companies had their own separate infrastructure and networks. Um, and as the internet's evolved, they've become more and more converged. Um, and so that's really what the metaverse is about. It's that increasing convergence and increasing immersiveness of internet experiences. Um, what we really do is we build... Um, data protocols to enable people to own their data and content on the internet, take that with them between applications. Um, we build technology for creating interoperable content and assets, um, particularly focused on generative AI. And then we work with world leading brands to showcase that technology in a range of different connected experiences. Um, and so took taking that technology and bringing it to life with the likes of Warner Brothers um, or um, FIFA or Reebok, um, a whole host of um, global leading brands that we can showcase how consumers can own their data and content on the internet and make it interoperable with other things. That's Aaron, us. <laughs> Aaron, thank you. And there's there's a lot <laughs> to be able to take in there. Could you tell us just a little bit more about the deal that you've recently struck with Warner Brothers and what we're going to see tangibly out of that? Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, worked for a couple of years on this. I think in the popular mind and popular culture, um, people understand the word metaverse um, mostly through the expression of Ernie Klein and Steven Spielberg and Ready Player One. You know, when it's the go-to kind of um, reference point for people to explain what they think the metaverse is and um, journalists and, you know, in popular culture, it's referenced all the time. In fact, when Apple Vision Pro launched um, late last year, um, their kind of PR campaign, Ready Player One was trending alongside that because it is so intrinsically linked to the popular mind about what the metaverse is. So as part of our mission to um, demonstrate what that can really mean for consumers, we wanted to have the world's best IP in these five different sectors. So sports, mass media, music, um, consumer goods, and um, celebrity and culture. And there is no better IP in the world than Ready Player One to to bring the idea of the open metaverse to life through. Um, and so we actually formed a vent joint venture with the creator, Ernie Klein, um, and producer of the movie, Dan Farah, and a partnership with Warner Brothers to own the IP for Ready Player One, to activate it in, in our, uh, using our technology and really show how we can bring lots of different games, applications, experience, and content together in one place, um, make it interoperable and give users power back over their data and content. Aaron, thank you. That's incredibly exciting. And I'm sure that there'll be lots of questions from um, our audience um, around that. So please put those in chat. Next up, I'd like to introduce... There is a bit of a tendency for, um, for Kiwi entrepreneurs to kind of downplay a little bit what they're doing. But my granddad it did always tell me to walk softly, but carry a big stick. Um, I think the, the core um, thing here is that the metaverse isn't some far off thing and it's not a game you play. It's around us every day. The average human will spend something like 45 years of their life looking at a screen. Um, and so the digital world the digital economy and the digital society is our world. It is our economy. It is our society. You know, like Lavina said, the systems and infrastructure that our, um, that our society is based on is based in this digital stuff. I think if we took that away um, or it broke, then society might collapse altogether. Um, so with that as context, <laughs> it's like really important that we put humans and communities back at the center of the platform that drives that world. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, when the, when the web three community in particular started to think about digital ownership online, you know, the things we value increasingly live in this digital space. Um, that was one of the core ideas of that movement and that technology was to, to put control of the underlying fabric of society and infrastructure back in the hands of communities. Um, and so we're kind of at this precipice now where, um, if we don't do that, the alternate is this kind of 
um, bad world where a mega corporation owns everything. In particular, as we see like AI having such a massive influence and broad influence on society at large, um, you know, if we can't get to a position where um, where everyday humans can have a have a real say about how that technology is used, how it's trained, how we, how it's applied in our society, then it's going to create some very, um, I think, terrible consequences. And so, um, when we think about um, creating technology that enables that ownership for individuals and communities, there are two halves to that. Um, to that problem. One half is the ownership half, which Web3 for digital um, uh, value solved. You know, you can own these things genuinely now. They're, they run on community, community run cloud infrastructure that isn't controlled by a single entity. The protocols have these cool things um, called smart contracts, which is essentially deterministic software, like um, Lavina was explaining before, that enable people to kind of rely on code in a way that wasn't possible before. Um, the other half of that, and particularly when it comes to how you bring that um, data to life in the content domain, is about interoperability. Because if you have ownership, but no interoperability, you really own nothing. Um, and I think that's been the real big challenge and problem for the Web3 community at large to demonstrate what the open metaverse looks like is because they focus so hard on on um, ownership and without bringing meaning to it with interoperability. Because if I can't take my stuff to somewhere else, then it has no value. value at, you know, ownership itself has no value if it can only be used in one place. And so that's really what we've been focusing on is adding that um, layer of interoperability and thinking about interoperability of content in a different way so that when you walk through to this next generation of the internet, which is this more immersive content domain, um, that you can have both of those things and you can truly be in control of those things as a community or as, as a user. Because we <clears throat> talked about, about yeah. you know, the fact that actually your, your success is your praises are sung overseas more than they are in New Zealand. So I'd just like to hear a little bit more about your experience. Yeah, I mean, I think um, New Zealand, if we could kind of drink, bring it back to, to New Zealand as a technology um, and investing community is very much centred around a couple of specialist areas. I think like business SaaS being one of them, you know, that mm -hmm. the success of Zero and the industry that, kind of the VC industry that built up around that success knows that formula well. And so when you're trying to do something different, it's hard to get people's attention. And and um, and even if you do, it's hard for them to understand what you're trying to do. Even like kind of the fundamental metrics and drivers. We have in my fund side of things, something like um, 45 active portfolio companies now, a lot of them are building in these areas of like consumer tech and, and things that aren't kind of that um uh aren't that, that central to new zealand's kind of thesis for investing and so they've had to look for other places to raise capital um and so you know we have a hard job explaining what we're doing because it's new and um there's lots of misinformation about it you know at the technology layer um, media in new zealand is actually pretty poor um you know group think type um approach to how they kind of see these new opportunities or or um, how this technology is being applied. There are very few mm -hmm. journalists that actually get it um, and understand the tech deeply. Um, we tend to jump on bang bandwagons. And like you mentioned, you know, Fut Futureverse has been in literally every other major publication in the world, you know, celebrating the success of this Kiwi company um that's you know generating hundreds of millions of dollars and and building technology for the world's biggest brands um you know publishing world leading ai research and all this kind of stuff and like not a not a not a boo from the new zealand media but we don't actually care about that too much because our market and our customers and our um community is is the world you know that's the the nature of business these days it is a global industry um but it does make it has made it difficult in the early stages um to um to grow the business um and to find talent and do all those kinds of things that um you might not have as a problem if you're if you're in another market that's more embraceive of of the consumer side of technology or of emerging technology in general 
Um, and so, you know, we've raised over the years across portfolio companies, um, you know, somewhere close to three or 400 million New Zealand dollars. Almost mm -hmm. all of that has been offshore um, because of the fact that, you know, the funding infrastructure for these kinds of businesses really doesn't exist in New Zealand and it's hard for the average investors to get their head around it. I know Movac in particular was like kind of the one, you know, stand out, you know, amongst that ecosystem that kind of um, was more focused on growth stage companies and um, had a little bit kind of, you know, I think probably a different outlook on on what made um, a successful company perhaps than, than a lot of the, the VC ecosystem in New Zealand. 